Now today, we will speak about primary prevention. As illustrated before, secondary and tertiary prevention intervene after a person has uh, become ill, that's tertiary prevention, or when someone is at risk of becoming ill, which is secondary prevention. Primary prevention, on the other hand, targets the entire population to be able to keep them from becoming ill in the first place. It is often underestimated how much peace, prosperity, and rationality are attributable to democracy. Democracy is the political manifestation of collective mental health in our day, which allows for the flowering of human potential, for which we have only seen a glimpse, and the desire to negate its progress actually is a part of the pathological drive for self-destruction we've been warning against. More significant than the actual doctrines of democracy are the psychological underpinnings of society's development. The Trump era has been a crushing demonstration of how rapidly and powerfully mental pathology can undermine a civilization built over centuries like an unexpected catastrophic illness that strikes a previously healthy person. The pummeling of order into disorder through the spread of mental pathology is what I've hitherto called Trump contagion. However, conditions have now accelerated and advanced to a degree where contagion is not enough to describe what has in truth become a societal shared psychosis or a folie a million, again, madness among millions. When some mutations reach a level of malignancy, we cease to call it lung disease or liver disease, but call it cancer. Hence, I shall now refer to this as Trump's collective psychosis, or we can refer back to Swiss psychiatrist Carl Jung's term, psychic ep epidemic, or even psychic pandemic, since a pandemic is an epidemic that has been spread worldwide, as has happened with Trump contagion. In such a state, each individual may or may not have a diagnosable psychotic illness, but a large segment of society behaves as if it were detached from reality or collectively exhibiting a psychosis. It is an effect of what cult expert and fellow colleague in the Harvard program in psychiatry and the law, Steve Hassan has called the cult of Trump. I've argued elsewhere, our need to see society as a unit and to identify, diagnose and prognosticate the course of societal mental disorders in the same way we do individual disorders. Groups or societies that take on uniform mental symptoms act very similarly to individuals with entrenched illnesses and therefore have little conflict about their maladaptive choices and in fact are compulsively and powerfully driven toward their own destruction. That's uh, what I have uh, warned that we may have entered in terms of a collective death spiral. Fortunately, we are mitigated somewhat in that, but the powerful drive is still present. So this predictable course of events could have been prevented much earlier, but it has been used for political exploitation instead. Permitting this unmitigated spread of collective psychosis essentially has one goal, to disable the people's ability to defend themselves. This is how a convicted criminal of 34 felonies with four indictments, uh, one conviction, 88 criminal charges, two impeachments, one act of sedition, 26 women alleging se sexual assault, and one confirmed sexual assault uh, and civil trial, who caused more American deaths than all the wars since the Civil War combined. Through his mismanagement of the COVID-19 pandemic, now threatens to be a dictator with the blessings of the Supreme Court as a, pre, as a Republican nominee and uh, still um, a front runner on par with 
the Democratic nominee. It is now a near certainty that whether Trump loses, loses or wins the election, there will be violence, whether in the form of civil unrest, civil strife, and the threat of civil war from without or mass arrests, systemic, systematic killings or purges from within, unless there is proper intervention. And this is the reason we find this to be an even more urgent time for mental health experts to speak up. And all this highlights the critical importance of primary prevention whereas tertiary and secondary prevention methods are urgent and cannot be omitted, primary prevention is the most important and most effective as it intervenes with the whole population before it falls ill. A large part of primary prevention in this case was educating the public about the threat of Trump contagion. That is why the destructive tragic and irresponsible actions on the part of the American Psychiatric Association in opposition to its ethical duties to the public uh, was extremely damaging in blocking this education. But all that we're currently experiencing is a known phenomenon in psychiatry, in medicine, and is predictable and preventable. The chief reason for my eminent colleagues and I getting together at the onset of Donald Trump's presidency to hold a conference and then to publish The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump was to alert against the very outcome where the most violent and most severely impaired who threatens and intimidates others into submission would become one of the presidential candidates. While most believe that uh, if we could survive one term, we would be rid of him. Mental health experts understood that the longer he stayed, uh, the harder it would be to get him out. Indeed, it had the potential to escalate to a point where the American Civil War would look mild and the two world wars could become mere footnotes in history. It was therefore critical to recognize Trump for who he was, to distinguish between the normal and the abnormal so that the compulsive spread of mental symptoms would not be mistaken for ordinary popularity. How would a lay person make this distinction without education by mental health experts? It's almost impossible. And that is also because the most dangerous personalities are also the most deceptive. So in 2016, the United States fell from a full to a flawed democracy with Donald Trump's candidacy, according to the annual democracy index from the Economist Intelligence Unit. And in 2020, the US was downgraded from a democracy to an anocracy, which is neither a democracy nor an autocracy, with Trump's refusal to concede as per the Polity Data series of the Center for Systemic Peace. In each of these times, the country was experiencing regression as well as descent into pathology, prone to extreme polarization, unrealistic expectations, and self-destructiveness. Although the US recovered its status as a democracy under Joe Biden's presidency, it no longer holds the designation as the world's oldest continuous democracy, which now belongs to Switzerland, followed by New Zealand, and then the United Kingdom. And now with the Hobson's choice, uh, which has uh, become between <laughs> a nation of uh, 330 million having to choose between uh, a rational candidate and a, um, and a mentally impaired candidate. The choice couldn't be clearer, but uh, we still are in the situation where either could take the White House in 2025. 
It is said that age two or three is the most violent age group, but because of the lack of physical strength, parental boundaries and societal protections, a toddler cannot blow up the world. But a grown man regressed to that age, who wants to be king and cannot accept either uh, other people as uh, people with rights, uh, such a person can. During the 2016 presidential debates, when Donald Trump inappropriately snuck up behind Hillary Clinton, had she said, get back, you creep, as she reflected years later, she would have won the election. This is because Trump was testing boundaries as a child might do, and having no internal limits of his own, he kept pushing like a domineering bully, which caught civilized society off guard. Democracies prevent the rise of dangerous personalities at multiple levels. These levels include by elevating our collective mental health to a point where we're no longer drawn to mentally impaired leaders. Also, by detecting and containing dangerous personalities better, they usually are taken into jails and prisons rather than simply uh, people being incarcerated by race, gender, or age group. There are structures that screen or limit these dangerous personalities from accessing power. And uh, by improving overall living conditions so that developmental wounds do not arise in the first place. So living conditions do have a role in our collective mental health and development. So we go beyond this to discuss an action, a primary prevention we actually have taken. In early 2020, upon the failure of the first impeachment, my colleagues and I at the World Mental Health Coalition met with a select group of citizens to address the needs of a populace gripped with disappointment, demoralization, and despair at the government's unconcern for its people. The government's refusal to address a problem of mental health had actually resulted in its failure of a much needed political process such as impeachment. And uh, there also was, uh, the impeachment may have succeeded, but conviction for trying to shake down a vulnerable ally for short-term political advantage uh, was not attainable. The suppression of critical information to a populace was proving to be the most pernicious, pernicious form of oppression of all. So we decided to come together, draft and publish the Declaration of the Freedom of Mind. It would be the first ever in history, according to British scholar and student uh, Matthew Bywater, who seized upon it as a new possibility for promoting mental freedom as a human right and he is currently working on submitting it to the United Nations General Assembly for adoption. Freedom of mind is a recurring notion during the time of um, the American Revolutionary War, depicting the need of fr to, to free ourselves of psychological as well as physical bonds. For example, Samuel Note lectured at that time, we need to break the chains which enslave our minds to forget the maxims which hinder our enjoying the blessings of a mental freedom. Break this one chain and you will find a way to break the rest. Movements for independence from colonial rule inspired similar thought. Indian social reformer Bim Rao Ambedkar said, a person whose mind is not free, though he may not be in chains, is a slave, not a free man. One whose mind is not free, though he may not be in prison, is a prisoner and not a free man. One whose mind is not free, though alive, is no better than dead. So the phenomenon of oppression is no different from what the founders experienced at the nation's inception. But our understanding needs updating, taking into account the psychological weapons that have since been developed through advertising and employing uh, 
mental health expertise to social media and other um, modes of control. So the result of our gathering in early 2020 is the following Declaration of Freedom of Mind, which I will uh, read in full because I believe it's an important way of safeguarding our collective mind. So here it goes. We at the World Mental Health Coalition believe that freedom of mind is a basic human right. It is at the core of all other freedoms and is fundamental to a working democracy. It is a primary sign of a healthy society without which all rational systems break down. It is a right that is derived from the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, these were declarations by the, the French government as well as uh, the United Nations. We declare that the ignorance, neglect, or contempt of the human right to freedom of mind are the principal cause and product of public disempowerment and oppression by governments. People denied of agency become easy tools of those intent on ruling rather than serving them. When this happens, police and prisons are no longer necessary. People themselves enthusiastically enlist their own servitude. We recognize that society as a whole is far from perfect in mental health and that a healing process is necessary for even the awareness of mental health matters to grow. This right, therefore, is provision as well as a striving. We aspire toward continually awake, awakening in people their natural, unalienable, and sacred human right to freedom of mind that political bodies should not abuse or suppress. Social systems ought to protect and nurture it, while experts on the human mind may educate about applying the knowledge we have gained on human cognitive and emotional development. With this awareness, we believe that the people, based on the simple laws of nature, will be empowered to live out their full potential to the happiness of all. Therefore, the World Mental Health Coalition recognizes and upholds the following human right to freedom of mind. As stated in the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights, endowed with the potential for reason and conscience and the obligation to act toward one another in a humane spirit. That's Article 1. Article 2, everyone is entitled to make informed decisions for themselves. This means that the people shall have access to information and the best available knowledge, including expertise, so that they can make informed choices about healthcare, education, distribution of wealth, and organization of power or other decisions that affect them. Full access to information and knowledge also means an opportunity to develop psychologically and to actualize their critical thinking skills, through education, nurturance, a knowledge-valuing environment, and secure conditions free from encumbrance by misinformation, propaganda, thought reform, and other toxic substances to the mind. Article 3. No one shall be held in mental slavery or servitude. When disinformation campaigns, mass manipulation through lying, and thought control poisons the environment, mass hysteria and cults of personality result. There shall be no abridging of speech, of the press, or of access to expertise when the people desire peaceably to assemble around matters that affect their mental health. Mental freedom also means that the people have an agency over their own minds and that their agency is protected. Hijacking minds so that people willingly follow ideas that do not serve their interests is not compatible with mental freedom. Article four, law is an expression of the general will. The people have a right to participate personally or through a representative in shaping laws that protect freedom of mind and prevents it prevent its slavery. 
Information from journalists, professionals, intellectuals, and whistleblowers increases freedom of mind and needs to be protected. Propaganda, mind control, and psychological abuse at large scale should be identified and curtailed, just as other forms of violence and abuse are punishable by law, especially since these deprivations are difficult to notice when many in society or the society itself is victimized at the same time. Laws may also be put in place to protect wholesome environments that nurture children's and adults' ability to reach their full mental potential and active input from mental health professionals regarding conditions that foster rather than impede mental health. Article five, since freedom of mind is an inviolable and sacred right, no one shall be deprived of it, actively or passively. Children shall be provided healthy psychological development, safety and stability, and supportive education so that they may build intellectual and emotional capacity and self-reliance. Adults shall be treated with dignity as beings capable of making reasoned and autonomous decisions for themselves, whereby no locus of control shall be external rather than internal, whether coerced or engineered. Hence forms the foundation of rational and thriving societies that can in turn engender healthy individuals. So you can find this Declaration of Freedom of Mind on the website of the World Mental Health Coalition, worldmhc.org.